Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest in Engineering for Change, or E4C's 2014 webinar series. Um, today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Meg Worth, the co-founder of Matronova. My name is Jennifer Berrigan, and I will be moderating today's webinar. I am a consultant in medical device management and innovation, and I've been working for the last eight years in global public health, focusing on improving access to medical devices in low resource settings. I currently serve as an E4C Solutions Library Program Advisor and as a reviewer for the Consortium for Affordable Technology Innovation Awards. I'd like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Innovations in Global Maternal Health. Childbirth presents a significant danger to a large portion of the world. To bring this into perspective, according to WHO, one woman dies every 60 seconds as a result of complications due to pregnancy or childbirth leaving one million children without a mother. Worldwide, each year, approximately 287,000 women die a maternal death. And for every woman that dies, 20 suffer injury, infection, or disease, approximately 10 million women each year. Though progress is being made towards the United Nations Millennium Development Goal number five, to reduce by three quarters between 1990 and 2015 the maternal mortality rate, Simple and low-cost life-saving technology is not yet readily accessible in limited resource settings. Fortunately, there is a big focus today on getting these technologies to those who need it the most. That's why E4C invited today's presenter, Meg Worth, to discuss more about what the organization she co-founded is doing in this regard. Thank you, Meg, for joining us today. I'd also like to take this moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series, Jana Aranda of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown, Jackie Holliday, and Steve Welch of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. If anyone has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact E4C via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Um, in case you are not already familiar with Engineering for Change, I would like to give you a little background on who we are. E4C is a global community that represents nearly 100,000 individuals, including technically-minded members and social media followers such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges faced by underserved communities around the world today, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, or other areas. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies like ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, academic supporters like MIT's Z-Lab, international development agencies like USAID, EWB USA, and Practical Action. Membership also provides access to a passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out the website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you are participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the E4C webinars webpage, engineeringforchange-webinars.org. If you're following E4C on Twitter, I'd also like to invite you to join the conversation with hashtag E4C webinars. E4C's next webinar will be at the end of May on the topic of agricultural devices. So stay tuned to the E4C webinars page for updates on the presenters and registration details. If you're already an E4C member, you will be receiving an invitation to the webinar soon. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, first, let's see where everyone is from. If you could please, in the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, type in where you're calling in from. Um, any technical questions or administrative problems should go into this chat window. Feel free to send a private chat to Holly or Jackie if you're having any issues. You can also use the uh, chat window to type any remarks you might have. And during the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located right below the chat, 
to type in your questions for the presenter. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. If that doesn't work, you can use the call-in number for the teleconference. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. Uh, following the webinar, to request a certificate of completion showing one professional development hour for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of the E4C webinars webpage. Okay, so I see a few people have entered where they're coming in from. Uh, I see many from the U.S., Hawaii, Boston, Georgia, New Jersey, I see Singapore, great, some international, um, Colorado, Switzerland. I'm also in Switzerland, so that's great, welcome. Uh, Canada, very good. Uh, so let's get started. Well, I would like to kick off today's webinar with a very brief background on medical devices and innovation. Um, in honor of World Immunization Week, I put in this particular image. I hope you can see it on my computer. It's not uh, appearing well, but if you can, you will see a, a child receiving a vaccination. And that's something that would not be possible without a syringe one of thousands of medical devices that exist in our world today. Fortunately, not all medical devices are as scary as a syringe is to a child, and they are a key component to providing critical quality health care. As with trained medical professionals, without them, medical diagnosis, treatment, and care would be impossible. They save lives every minute of every day. So what exactly is a medical device? Well, according to WHO, it is an article, instrument, apparatus, or machine that is used in the prevention, diagnosis, or treatment of illness or disease, or for detecting, measuring, restoring, correcting, or modifying the structure or function of the body for some health purpose. Devices range from stethoscopes and eyeglasses to the most complex magnetic resonance imaging machines and include devices used in childbirth, such as delivery forceps, syringes for injection of critical medications, and other surgical instruments. Unfortunately, critical medical devices in limited resource settings are often not available, may be completely inappropriate for the setting, are sometimes found sitting in a brand new box unopened, or are entirely broken and taking up space in critical patient areas. Improper procurement, poor donation practices, and lack of maintenance contribute to these issues. In light of the difficulties in repairing such a complex system, Innovative devices that are simple to use, require little maintenance, are practical, easy to transport, and low cost are being developed at an incredible pace. WHO's annual compendium of innovative health technologies, academic networks, and programs such as the Consortium of Affordable Medical Technology, NC2A, award programs like Grand Challenges Canada and Saving Lives at Birth, plus the addition of numerous academic courses on innovation in low-resource settings, highlight just how rapidly this field has grown in the last few years. The issue is, in getting the best of these devices through the development phase successfully, into the commercial market, and into the healthcare systems of those in developing countries with the greatest need for them. Many useful tools already exist, but they are not reaching target populations. The reason for this is complex and one that every woman, every child is trying to address through their United Nations Commission on Life-Saving Commodities. The Commission has issued 10 recommendations that implementing partners are currently addressing. These include shaping markets, improving quality of products, and strengthening regulatory systems, along with improving awareness and utilization of the 13 commodities they identified as the most critical. Furthermore, WHO, UNICEF, and UNFPA are getting ready to release an interagency list of essential interventions on reproductive maternal, newborn, and child care. Ministries of Health will look to this for guidance, but the next step of how and what to purchase is critical. And this is why I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today. Matronova is filling a critical gap, and I am personally very excited not only about what they are doing for maternal health, but also for the example they are setting for medical devices globally. So I'm honored to introduce our presenter. Meg Worth is the co-founder of Matronova. She has worked on women's health throughout her career, from Appalachia to Borneo. Meg's expertise is in maternal health technology and innovation. She was co-author of the UN Millennium Project's final report on child and maternal health. I will now turn it over to Meg. Good day, everybody. I am uh, so happy uh, to be uh, presenting today. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody, from uh, Singapore uh, to the US and, and everywhere in between. 
I uh, am going to go through a presentation to tell you about um, Modern OVA and uh, the lessons that we've learned along the way in developing what is a social enterprise focused on maternal and newborn health. The first slide uh, is really um, focusing on um, uh, feedback from customers. Um, and, and to us, this is a, an absolutely critical component of, of what we do and what is the end game for every entrepreneur, inventor, and engineer out there working in this field. And this is what we want to hear. We want to hear from the folks using the product, not in its pilot stage, but in its full um, realization of commercialization. This is a note from Haiti Village Health. Uh, thank you for your inspired commitment to practical technologies. Uh, though it was sent to us, um, we re really view it as a thank you to everyone working in this field. Um, and uh, it really very much in the spirit of getting products out and accelerating the time in which uh, the time that it takes to get a product from conception out to widespread uptake. And I think that's uh, the work that is being done across the globe. It is a place where Modernova is stepping in to, to again, accelerate progress. I want to go through uh, the three leading causes of maternal, both maternal death, but also maternal morbidity. Um, meaning um, ill health or, or consequences uh, that, that uh, detract from, from women's health. Many of you will already know that um, hemorrhage or excessive bleeding um, is a leading cause of death for women. Um, usually this happens in the postpartum period or after a woman gives birth. Uh, there is a certain amount of, of blood. Uh, but um, when it becomes excessive or if a woman is anemic to start, uh, she can bleed to death very quickly. And in fact, it's very important to know that, uh, you know, in the absence of any treatment, uh, a woman can, can lose blood at such a rate that she will expire in just two hours uh, from the onset of a massive postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, now, uh, aside from being a very grim um, and sobering issue from a medical perspective, I, I want to mention that there are many ways to think about uh, reducing hemorrhage and addressing this issue. A lot of folks um, look right at the moment uh, that the hemorrhage is occurring. So there are some interesting, very, very low-tech uh, products and ideas and solutions out there ranging from the Quayam blood mat in Bangladesh that alerts folks to um, how uh, much blood has been lost to uh, graduated or uh, graduated um, drapes that again alert people to to loss of blood. But if you think um, generally about the issue, there there are um, there's a lot of work to be done um, in terms of thinking about biomedical design and devices in early warning signs in uh, new devices that could alert people more rapidly to problems, uh, mobile devices, um, devices that could go home with a mother so she starts bleeding later, you can still address the issue. Um, what I really want to do in this presentation is focus on the fact that uh, maternal health is not a niche issue, um, that there are many antecedents to um, maternal ill health uh, or problems during childbirth. Uh, that, that really can be addressed by bright minds from around the world and that there is so much more uh, that needs to be done and, and could be done. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about our solutions for, for doing this. The next slide um, looks at eclampsia, which is a profound um, hypertensive disorder, which is usually manifest um, in a woman um, having uh, seizures and eventually uh, women dying. This is in many countries. Uh, what happens um, during, during childbirth and, and, uh, and can accelerate very rapidly. Again, it is an emergency situation. 
So the question is, um, from an, again, an engineering, a biomedical research, biomedical design point of view, um, what are the early markers of preeclampsia? What can you find in the urine? Um, what can you do to address the fact that women may have eclamptic uh, seizures after they go home? Um, we want to stress the need for innovative ideas uh, that go beyond the moment of birth to predicting uh, and following up on these, these issues. And uh, I will talk a bit more uh, later about a technology um, that starts to get at some of those questions. Um, similarly, uh, women um, and their providers, the traditional birth attendants and community health workers, don't, um, don't always know that this is a severe danger sign uh, of pregnancy. And so if you are interested in um, mobile health or early detection and warning signs, um, information, education, communication, um, all of those innovations and solutions have a role to play in preventing what is uh, either the leading or the second uh, most common cause of maternal death and morbidity. And this is a really interesting frontier of research in um, both you know, the industrialized countries as well as uh, the developing world. This is a, a, an issue that um, is really a frontier and deserves quite a bit more information and research. And finally, I just want to mention, and again, these are in large, bold uh, colors to drive home these three leading causes. Many of them are very interlinked and interrelated, um, postpartum hemorrhage and infection uh, linked to one another. Um, in, in some cases, a woman has been enduring an infection for, for years, uh, years, potentially, if it's a sexually transmitted infection, or for the months during pregnancy. What are the innovative technologies, um, rapid diagnostics, uh, tests, simple, um, simple methods to, uh, uh, to research sepsis and infection ahead of time, and one that I will point out um, certainly um, HIV and uh, syphilis are two uh, very prevalent um, infections that have profound consequences for the newborn and for the outcome of the pregnancy. So again, to review uh, hemorrhage or excessive bleeding, um, eclampsia and preeclampsia and sepsis infection are what many call in the public health space the uh, proximate or immediate causes of death, but many of them have antecedents in the woman's um, life and in her pregnancy. And I, I really want to drive those home for those of you who are more on the, the research side of things. So let's just get to um, Modern OVA and why, uh, why we would create uh, such a, an entity. And, and uh, really what Modern OVA is, is an online e-commerce platform where what we do is research uh, hundreds of innovations and solutions in maternal and newborn health. We started that way um, in order to let everyone know what the, what the state of the art of innovation was. What we found was that um, you know, there were a lot of incubator um, research projects and, and new ideas coming out. There were many of them, but we noticed that certain um, groups were not talking with other groups, and, and some seemed unaware that products were further along in the uh, commercialization pipeline than others. What we did with Modern Nova starting in 2009 was we put all of the products up in an open source library, and sort of an interesting thing happened. As we built our social media presence, and I would um, Love it if everyone um, followed us on Twitter, at Modernova, um, and sent us ideas and information, because that's really a lot of the currency of how we built our, our social enterprise and our company. What we found was that people were really interested, theoretically, in the innovations and the technologies, but they wanted something much more immediate. Uh, and what they wanted was access to the products. And we saw this as a very exciting market opportunity. Um, at first, we looked around to see who else uh, could possibly, you know, who we could refer them to. And, and we didn't find an obvious answer. And so being entrepreneurial, 
we decided that we would try our best to fill this missing link. And uh, what, we, what we wanted to do was meet the demands of the customers. They were saying, where is this product and how can I buy it and how can I get it now? Um, very, very practical uh, questions. They also ask things like, who else has tried it? What's the literature on it? Um, what were the findings of the pilot studies? And so from those initial forays and, and um, these um, explorations, we created uh, what was at first just 10 products online that you could purchase. Um, and now we have expanded what we're offering to include 40 products, um, all in the maternal and newborn health space. The idea for doing that is, is fairly simple. I mean, it's an online catalog. We also send out a paper catalog. The reason we do it is because we know that, in general, the people providing frontline care are midwives, nurses, and doctors. They are in private franchise clinics. They're in standalone clinics. Um, they are part of large humanitarian organizations, and they're part of government-funded groups. But uh, what, what they're doing is usually providing assistance at childbirth at the point of care, needing the latest products, um, not having time to research the most appropriate and newest technologies. And so what Modern Nova is set up to do is to push out information and pull in information uh, all in one place. The same frontline provider who uses one product to look, look at or treat eclampsia will inevitably in her next birth or the next week uh, encounter one of the other issues. And so it makes sense to us to market similar products together um, to, to put in one place uh, life-saving technologies, to market them to the same end users, and to send them out in customizable bundles based on need. Our typical customer um, they, well, it's hard to say. It's, it's not terribly typical, but what we started, um, what we started doing was selling to um, experimental, innovative nonprofit groups. A lot of them were online, looking at social media and researching products. Um, we began with these innovative nonprofits. We then um, targeted uh, the larger humanitarian uh, groups. Um, including places like the International Rescue Committee, who are in uh, dozens and dozens of, of countries providing frontline care. Um, and now we have moved on to direct, uh, we have moved on, including those other two classes of customer, to um, ministries of health. So we, due to our search engine capabilities, we are able uh, to attract, um, you know, folks who are in the Ministry of Health office looking for technologies or looking for new solutions. And uh, we are just, um, in 2013 to 14, we've started selling directly to Ministries of Health. So to look at this um, slide uh, quickly, um, I do want to mention that we are a hybrid business model. And uh, Modern Nova began with the social enterprise, which is the e-commerce platform that I described. Um, and then in 2013, in the summer, we added um, Modern Nova Research, which is a nonprofit entity. Um, and Emily Taylor is online. Um, she is leading Modern Nova Research. The two, organi the two um, pieces are really two separate organizations that work together fairly seamlessly, where in the Modern Nova research arm, we um, uncover innovative new products, um, ideas, and solutions. And in some cases, we consult or help those groups to move more quickly by finding them pilot sites and end users and, um, and perhaps stepping in to help uh, with the rebranding and marketing of the product. In other cases, we really just pick up uh, the product once it has reached um, a certain stage, and we help to market it in countries where it may not have much of a presence. I think um, one of the reasons we started Modern Nova is that we were, uh, we felt as though um, the process could be accelerated. Um, the process means 
the point uh, from which a great idea is validated in a pilot study to the time at which it is commercialized and widely available in the uh, countries where it is needed the most. And uh, that is really our sweet spot and uh, the approach that we are, we are taking. Um, if, we, uh, if we market, sell, and distribute complementary reproductive health products, uh, we believe we can spread information more quickly. In the business world, you know, it would be called customer awareness, where we're making um, people uh, aware of the very existence of these products. Um, and, uh, you know, more in the nonprofit world, we are spreading, spreading information more quickly. And we're really uh, poised at a balance between these two worlds and uh, trying to sh prove out a model that will allow folks to move much more quickly. Um, we've talked about the statistics. Uh, this actually is a photograph of a, a woman suffering from uh, preeclampsia. Um, we felt when we were founded that there, you know, there is a lot of um, pointing to the negative statistics of maternal health, and indeed they're very sobering. Um, what we wanted to start to point to was the amazing number of solutions that are out there. And though we all know there's a human resource sh shortage globally and that it's most acute in the countries that are the worst off in terms of their health outcomes, there are still 14 million nurses and midwives who need rapid access to life-saving innovations. Um, Jennifer, in her terrific introduction, mentioned all of the, you know, very inspiring new sources for innovations in maternal health. And these are coming out of universities and labs and nonprofits. Um, there are indeed uh, hundreds. Uh, of, of innovations. When we started, we, we had a, a core of about 20 um, in 2009, and we're now at almost over 300 innovations in maternal and newborn health. I mean, what I really want to emphasize to all of you, again, is this idea that maternal health is not a niche issue, that water uh, plays, of course, a tremendous role in women's health and girls' health, and a subset of those women and girls will become mothers, uh, will will go through pregnancy. And so uh, water um, and transport and things like sterilization of, of medical equipment are all things that will profoundly uh, affect um, maternal health and, and should be thought of as such. Um, in this picture, we sort of show a, a range of all of the products um, that, that we cover, and the range is from the simple fetoscope up in the upper left-hand corner, which is uh, used across the world, um, to the lower left, which is the hemoglobin color scale, uh, WHO-approved uh, technology to detect anemia using a colorimetric scale. Um, in the middle is a rapid diagnostic using uh, wicking paper. Uh, on the right is the Kiwi um, device uh, for obstructed labor. Um, and then we, we also heard Jennifer mention uh, the, um, the importance of vaccination. And here in, the, in this um, Uniject technology, you can see uh, how a medical device uh, that can automatically disable can radically uh, change both dosing as well as uh, infection prevention in the process of vaccination. For, for women, um, the tetanus toxoid vaccination is uh, absolutely key and in most countries is part of antenatal care. Um, so, you know, the one category that, that folks should think about is really how do you improve on existing technologies. Um, there's a group in Uganda looking at um, you know, hooking up that simple feet, uh, fetoscope, that uh, funnel-shaped object that you see in the upper left of your screen, hooking that up to a mobile device. And, and how could that use this well-known technology um, and, and enhance it? Uh, um, similarly, uh, there are groups who have figured out how to create a solar-powered blood pressure cuff, blood pressure for the hypertensive diseases of pregnancy and for diagnosing preeclampsia and other uh, issues, absolutely key to antenatal care and beyond. Um, 
similarly, a, a group of researchers found that you may need slightly different technology uh, to, to think about um, measuring blood pressure in pregnant women, another very interesting uh, area of, of research. So for, for each of these technologies, there are very interesting tweaks and modifications um, and enhancements that could be made for different uh, settings. But there's also completely out of the box thinking. Um, the Embrace uh, incubator is, is featured here. Uh, what if you were able to take the incubator out of the tertiary care setting and, and uh, into the community? Um, lots of um, rapid diagnostics and labs on a chip can radically change uh, the ability to detect very early signs of complications in women, um, in pregnant women, and um, are, are really, um, to us, some of the most exciting and, and promising technologies. Uh, to allow us uh, out into the field. Um, where are they coming from? Um, we have a couple universities uh, named here. Um, we have gone uh, well beyond the US-based uh, universities um, to, to virtually every corner of the globe, and sometimes that takes more digging. One of the disconnects that we've noticed is um, you know, that uh, a lot of the big contests that you think about for appropriate technologies in health are based in the U.S. and thus will source uh, a lot from the U.S. But to us, the most exciting uh, technologies are coming out of uh, the settings um, where they're most needed. So uh, that in the center, um, uh, in the photos, you see uh, what is um, – a fetal heart rate monitor. And um, this was developed in Uganda by a, a midwifery group um, providing very high quality of care. And again, like so many of the technologies that we feature and that we love and promote, um, this, this is a very interesting little um, permutation of that um, fetoscope. You can see uh, it has um, some symbols, signs, and reminders in different languages on it. And what they've done is say, all right, use this, whole, this, um, this fetoscope. We have a 15-second timer, and we have a color-coded counting beads. Um, and this can be used to detect fetal heart rate and determine whether or not there's a complication going on as the mother um, gets closer to, to childbirth. Modernova's role here has nothing to do with the development of the technology, but what we've seen is an indigenously developed, tested technology that is incredibly exciting, extremely low cost, developed by midwives in Uganda. And where we step in is to help to market um, this technology, to let others know about it in the catalog, to push it out to ministries of health and elsewhere, and to get it uh, into use in other settings. Um, the group in Uganda could do this, but they are focused on, on providing care locally and expanding their model locally. They are focused on clinical care. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is a terrific example of, of how um, we source sort of the ideal technologies. We also have innovations coming out of um, the Philippines, um, multiple places in India, Pakistan, um, uh, Nigeria, and, uh, you know, and uh, Uruguay, uh, very, very exciting range. And I think if I were to project forward, what we'd love to see is um, more and more rapid uh, sharing of uh, technologies developed for the base of the pyramid in the base of the pyramid countries. Um, the final device that you see on the right I will discuss at some length, um, and that's the non-pneumatic anti-shock garment. The other thing. To, to just note is, um, you know, a lot of us work in the nonprofit sector, and that certainly is where my background is from. But if you really take a step back and, and look at the international market for medical devices just in obstetric and neonatal commodities, um, we come, we, we uh, by our calculations, find that it's a $15 billion market even in the poorest countries of the world. Uh, so. You know, this is where all of, of you who are entrepreneurs and innovators, this is where uh, 
you want to behead it um, in order to reach scale. And I think that's, that's quite important. Um, this is another depiction on this slide of where Modernova works. We see ourselves as a wheel um, connecting two groups. Uh, the, the top um, gear entrepreneurs, um, innovators, nonprofits, large organizations, and small uh, need a fast track to commercialize medical innovations for the rest of the world. How do, you, how do uh, 200 different groups go about getting products out into the market to be used by the same end user? Um, on the other side with the cross, you see our customers or the end users, procurement agencies, uh, humanitarian groups, private healthcare groups, um, are all interested in the latest products but don't know what to trust or where to look for them. What we want to solve on a single platform is that we want to become a trusted place uh, for researching and purchasing um, maternal and newborn health innovations. And uh, what that means is that we don't want to just take any product that comes along. What we're doing on our nonprofit side with Modern Nova Research is uh, that we are testing products with, with trusted partners in the field and giving them really a, a kind of a stamp of approval um, so that um, so that you know it's no it's known is this a cool idea did it win a contest that's great but how well does it work over time did it break after a year um, is the company still around so that you could even you know get a replacement or or ask for customer service really very very practical questions other questions would be well how does it stack up when when run head to head with its competitor and these are pieces of information that we really think are, are missing right now um, design that matters has said and they're we're big fans of, of their work you know they've sort of said don't don't design to win a contest you know design for sustainability and we want to um, be able to provide um, a, a description of, of quality and ruggedness and customer feedback uh, over time um, by, by uh, having a platform where these products can be rated, actually. Um, so, so this is our vision. It is a big, uh, it is a big vision, but as a startup, um, that's, that's how, how you generate your, uh, your, your power and your staying power. Um, we want to make uh, access to global health technologies as easy as click and ship. And we know, uh, certainly from experience, all of the regulatory hurdles and barriers that um, make that difficult. We want to remove a lot of those and, and uh, put those um, in place, but, uh, but make it seem as easy as click and ship. So we have product sales, and then we have um, our own proprietary products and a collaboration platform, which gets at the question of, uh, you know, groups who are all using the same product together. Um, how can they collaborate and write papers or um, undertake studies um, or inform ministries of health in tandem so that these are not happening um, country by country, pilot by pilot? This again is uh, our holy grail, which is um, you know a photo of newly trained midwives. The newly trained midwife is in the pink suit in in. Um, uh, in the scrubs uh, in Haiti using a product that Modern Nova helped get there. Um, it's not our product, but um, we we're able to um, get it to uh, end users who had never heard about it before and to accelerate that process of commercialization that we described. Um, this is another kind of view of our, um, of our goal, which is um, combining content commerce and collaboration with a trusted source in the middle. Um, I think, you know, there are lots of groups and, and terrific groups that review technologies and look at them, but to get back to the piece that I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, you can't always access the technology, and, and groups spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to actually purchase it, so we're hoping to fill that gap. Briefly, um, this technology is the non-pneumatic anti-shock garment. Um, it's an incredible medical device because it's completely non-invasive, and what it does is actually buy time. Um, the compression suit um, wraps around a woman, shunts blood back to her core. There's a hard foam ball in the middle 
of, uh, of the device that presses on the uterus. Um, this changes the odds that I mentioned earlier. A woman who is hemorrhaging has about two hours. Using this suit, um, you can buy her, uh, depending on her situation, a lot more time to get to a facility, to get blood, to get treatment. The next technology that I want to mention is one that we're partnered with. Um, Biosense came out of India. And this is a really amazing um, smartphone-enabled device, although it can be done on a very basic uh, Android-type uh, phone. Um, and what it does is it takes uh, urinalysis um, with a dipstick test um, into a mini lab that uh, costs about one-tenth of what a benchtop analyzer would cost. Um, and using this really neat little white room um, it stabilizes and standardizes the light using the camera of the smartphone to analyze um, up to 14 parameters simultaneously with a urine dipstick. So we are working on this technology, um, we believe in Zimbabwe and, and Tanzania, to test midwives' ability to, to use your analysis and really to look at issues uh, like eclampsia uh, and um, predicting eclampsia and preeclampsia earlier in pregnancy. So this is a bit about um, Modern Nova's momentum. We have shipped product to 30 countries. Um, we have 170 countries engaged online. We have 40 products. We'll be moving to at least 60 products by the end of the year. Our goal isn't an unlimited number of products. Again, it's a trusted set of interventions that are uh, symbiotic and synergistic and uh, work together, uh, ideally for our end customers in the lowest resource settings of the world. Our goal is 6 million lives by 2016. And I'd like to you know, really thank everybody uh, for being part of this seminar. I hope you have questions. I hope you have ideas. Uh, imagine that there are innovations out there um, from all the corners of the world where you work that we haven't covered well, and we'd love to hear about them. Um, so thanks again to the organizers for this incredible opportunity, and again, our, uh, our main currency is ideas, um, and we welcome your ideas. Thanks so much. So I think um, we can go to questions. All right, thank you, Meg. Um, that was wonderful. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for uh, questions and answers. So if you all could take a look down at the bottom right-hand part of your screen um, and where it says Q&A, if you could please enter your questions so that Meg uh, can take some time and answer them. Um, and let me take a look and see if anything has popped up. I believe you answered one of these already, Meg. Um, the other one that's up there right now is, um, how long does the mat distinguish between amniotic fluid, urine, et cetera, from blood when determining hemorrhage alerts? Right, so um, that's a good question, and this is an interesting technology um, where where uh, we have not actually been very successful in um, getting. We're in touch with the entrepreneur um, uh, and and folks that work with them, but um, getting it out of Bangladesh and elsewhere has not become a reality. So I know these are all issues that they're they're working on um, and sort of counting in amniotic fluid and urine uh, from blood is, is one of the main issues. So we don't have a great answer to that question, but it is absolutely critical. And um, I do know uh, with the variation on that theme that we do have, which is a um, graduated under buttocks drape, it's called. It's basically um, something that uh, comes down in a funnel with graduated um, milliliter markings, and in it, you know users are instructed to sweep away the amniotic fluid or urine um, and to put the drape on you know after birth. Uh, so it's not a perfect um, system, but it has been shown uh, certainly that in study after study, it's shown that. Um, um, providers, whether they're OBGYNs or village midwives, tend to underestimate blood loss. And so having some sort of quantification uh, of blood loss um, to alert 
people, even if it's somewhat imperfect, is, is very, very important. But I would say there's no perfect solution to that yet. Um, okay. Um, there was another question that came in. Um, I keep losing it because it uh, keeps sliding on me. Oh, here it is. Um, are you seeing particular countries beyond the U.S. leading the way in terms of maternal health technology innovation? Yes, that's a great question. Um, um, certainly India, um, and that includes uh, anemia detection um, and things like uh, all kinds of, of rapid tests. Um, there's a lot in Brazil, a lot going on in Brazil. Um, we have a whole subset of um, products that were developed in uh, Uruguay, um, all specific to maternal and newborn health and grew out of, the, out of PAHO, WHO's um, Pan American Health Organization sister organization. Um, so those are a few of, of the countries. Um, there's a lot of experimentation in places like uh, Nepal and, and Pakistan and, and uh, a lot happening in Uganda and Nigeria. So um, those are just places we have happened um, to, to have partnerships and, and contacts. And, um, but, but we know that uh, some of the most interesting work is, is not happening here, actually. Uh, and that shouldn't be surprising. I think we, we are very committed to um, breaking through language barriers and, and, um, and marketing products as rapidly as possible and, and marketing ideas and solutions that maybe they don't have IP behind them. Perhaps they have no uh, revenue associated with them, but they're still just as, just as critical. Okay, Meg, um, I don't see other questions, so I'm going to ask a few, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, uh, I'm interested to know if you include devices that are not considered innovative, um, because from my experience, I see that sometimes ministries of health need to know what's just out there, and there are technologies that exist already that would be effective for what they need, but they just don't have a resource, and they don't know how to compare all the different technologies. Um, and and to go along with that, you know, how do you compare technologies? Do you give them an ability to say, well, this one is better than that one for the same function? That's a really great question and certainly something that we found um, as we delved more and more into this. And that was we were really enamored of innovations and, and cool ideas, um, and we still are. But uh, as we talked to more and more end users and customers, we did find that, um, you know, is something an innovation if it was invented 15 years ago? You know, at a certain point, you don't care. Um, if the person can't access it, uh, it would be innovative to them. So we have definitely stepped in to things that, um, you know, are, are now so standard in some places they wouldn't be called innovative. An example would be the MUAC tape for child health, um, which, I think was pioneered by Médecins Sans Frontières, but uh, a lot of groups have trouble um, accessing um, just a simple tape uh, to measure the mid-upper arm circumference. So um, when we hear from customers again and again that it's hard to access the product, uh, we do, we do um, and it's something that is critical to maternal health outcomes. We, we do step in, and we're increasingly adding those kinds of products to our site. Similarly, you know, your basic set of um, stainless steel instruments that any OBGYN should have, we are looking um, now at supplying, you know, um, sets of those from a very low cost but still well-regulated um, and trusted source. Um, or plastic versions of that for people that need in an emergency and don't even have the ability to sterilize. So it's a great question, and I would say over our evolution, we have become uh, equally interested in core uh, products that are not well supplied. So, and that comes about because you can imagine if they're coming to us for their hemoglobinometer and their other antenatal care, well then 
it might be just as easy with one transaction to order their more sort of core non-innovative supplies, and that's how our business model is evolving. Right, um, and just to, to follow up to that, is, do you have a place where they can compare technologies? So you showed us the fetoscope oh, with right. the beads, but there's also a fetoscope, you know, regular one. So is there a way to compare what one does and what and what the other one doesn't and vice versa? Right, um, we're we're working towards that. So um, we we would like to have more of a almost a consumer reports function um, where you can compare how things um, work, like what requires the least training, um, what is the most specific um, and sensitive. And we're not really quite there yet, but what we do find ourselves with almost every order, we're sort of advising the group as well. So they'll say, okay, this is for OBGYNs, what would you suggest? Or what? And usually it's what we say is um, not what we personally would suggest, but our other customer in Colombia uses this and they have found it effective. So it's that, uh, at, at this point in time, that's, that's where we are, but you are pointing to a quite a critical um, need, which is rapid feedback on what's most appropriate for where you are. Okay, um, someone you. asked if we ship to point of use. Uh, yes. So a lot of our business is drop shipping, um, where you know we just happen to be in the U.S. We, but um, we will you know ship from the manufacturer or the inventor or the nonprofit that ha that created the technology to the end user. Um, so okay, I have a yeah. sorry. Yeah. I have a number of very good questions coming in. Um, in your database, you have technologies being implemented, dormant, and in development. How do you support these innovations to move further the product development path until it becomes a commercialized product? Right. So we choose um, a subset of products based on a few things. One is um, how it, checking with our customers, partners, and advisors where we think um, the greatest need and demand will be. Um, then checking with the you know entrepreneur if they're sort of on their own uh, journey or trajectory. Um, they sometimes don't necessarily want input from uh, someone else, or they have a, a, another um, alternative. Then then it's not a good fit. But if we have discussions and then it, it looks as though we can move forward, um, we step in as partners basically to to help move the product forward. So for an example, we did that with something called the Thermospot. That's a newborn health technology, although we actually think it could be a maternal health technology as well. It's a stick-on thermometer to measure core body temperature and address hypothermia, something that happens uh, to women um, when they go uh, into shock from postpartum hemorrhage and other complications. The beauty of that technology is that it's not numbers or, or literacy-based, it's um, color-based warning sign that your core body temperature is too low. And so we've been working with that entrepreneur and manufacturer to rebrand um, that product and to, to market it much more widely. And through that process, we actually um, helped to get the product into large-scale pilots in uh, Pakistan and Kenya. Um, it had already been tested in India. So that's one example. OK, uh, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, how do you select your innovations? What are your mechanisms for distribution in the countries where you deploy the technologies or who distributes them? I guess that's Well, wow, those are great questions. questions. Each one is probably <laughs> a half hour discussion. Um, we, we select them really based on the assured criteria, which we could send the link out to if, if those that don't know it, but it's, uh, you know, how was it designed for low resource settings? How rugged is it? How sensitive and specific it is? Will it be able to clear regulatory hurdles, either, you know, usually a CE marking, um, has it been tested elsewhere, uh, you know, a sort of a, a list of about 10 screens that we do for the product. Um, and then the mechanism for in-country are um, quite a range. Um, when we're working, say, if we're sending to the UN uh, or the international humanitarian groups, we work just directly with their procurement arms. But in country, um, we are usually working with an import agent, a distributor, uh, and um, 
you know, it's a partner distribution agreement country by country or region by region. Right now we're working on one for a, a group of um, a trading block in Central Africa. Okay, we have one more minute, so I can read out one more question. Um, what capabilities are you investigating to support consultation on site during pre-delivery delivery situations, communication links, monitoring, et cetera? Right. It sounds like it's a mobile health question. And um, yes. one thing we found is that, you know, the mobile health sector is incredibly robust, even having the M Health Alliance. Um, and so while we started looking at a lot of those technologies, we, we're, I would say, um, not investing a lot of time and energy there except for maybe uh, cherry picking a little bit of the, of the best solutions and spreading the word on the great work that others are doing. An exception to that would be that um, UCheck Biosense device that I mentioned because they uh, allow, um, what, what we're really interested in is technologies that have some hardware component but also link to, to mHealth or to um, sending information by mobile phone or to the cloud. Um, so that UCheck device is one example of that. There's also a really interesting technology called M Water, um, where they are allowing with a simple water testing device um, to measure E. coli, and then they push information on that uh, to the cloud so that there's a crowdsourced, open source map of um, the the quality of, of water at different service points, and that's in uh, Tanzania right now. So I would say, in general, we track that space, um, but we're not quite as engaged as we are in the actual hardware slash medical devices. OK, thank you, Meg. Um, I think that's all we unfortunately have time for. It's uh, 6.01. So thank you, Meg. Thank you so to much, all everybody. the attendees. Thanks, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. On the screen right now, you're going to see the PDH code and email address should you wish to earn a professional development hour. If you have any questions about the webinar series, feel free to email the webinar team. And finally, don't forget to become an E4C member to never miss a webinar announcement. We wish you a pleasant day, evening, or night, and look forward to seeing you next time.